Hi, I'm Reverend Amy. Welcome to worship. So here we are. We've had a beautiful day, but I can feel the rain about to move in, which means if you're seeing this, we are worshiping virtually. I know it's frustrating. Two rained out services, not to mention two in a row. Hang on, we are working on a new and improved rain plan. I know we all wish we could send this rain out west to the wildfires. Perspective. I'm glad to worship with you in whatever way we can. We should be old pros at flexibility by now. So let's take a deep breath, center ourselves, and prepare to worship God. On my best days, I believe that God is there, standing in the sun with me, laughing a contagious laugh and cheering me on. On my hardest days, I believe that God is there, standing in the rain with me, holding me up and sharing in my grief. No matter where I go, in joy or in loss, in pain or in love, in heartache or in gratitude, I believe that God is there, leaning in, noticing where it hurts, and carrying me through it. And so I believe we are called to care for each other as God cares for us. On your best days in the sun, and on your worst days in the rain, I will do my best to be there for you too. Amen. so glad you could join me here today. This week, I have been thinking about how we can welcome new people to our communities. I have been taking classes this summer virtually from my computer at home, and I learned something this week. In, one, in my class, I'm teaching students who are learning English in high school as a new language. Maybe they speak one or two languages already and English is new to them. I learned how often these English language learners speak out loud during the school day. What percentage of the school day, say between the hours of 8 a.m. and 2 p.m., do these students who are learning English speak out loud? We're including lunchtime in this six hour day. First, I'll tell you my guess. I guessed 10% of the day. That would mean that these English language learners spoke about 36 minutes between 8 a.m. and 2 p.m. I'll give you a hint. I was wrong. I was way off. Students learning English in high school, on average, speak only 2% of the time. That's it. That means from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m., they only speak for about 7.2 minutes. By the time I stop recording this video, I may have already spoken for 7.2 minutes. This is heartbreaking. It reminded me of a story of my friend Sharina from high school. We met in my junior year when she came to live with a family in town as an exchange student from Kazakhstan. When we first met, I had to look up Kazakhstan on a map. Go ahead, push pause, look it up on your Google, it's okay. At the beginning, Sharina knew almost no English. Our conversations were limited and it took work. As my German relatives would say, we spoke with our hands and our feet more than we ever spoke with words. But it was well worth the effort because we formed a lifelong friendship which started with giggling about the song Ice Ice Baby. Go ahead, Google that song too. So what can we do to help? Well, I think as the hands and feet of God, it is our job to reach out and make the effort. Do you know someone who is learning English or even new to our community? Reach out to this person and make them feel welcome. Your efforts will not go unnoticed. In our congregation and across the Capital District, we partner with Family Promise to help homeless families. Through COVID, these families are not staying in our building, but we continue to make meals for them and support them as they become members of our communities. Maybe your family would like to reach out to help these families in some way. If you would like to do that, you could email me and I can put you in touch with the people in charge of our Family Promise group. 
in, you can reach me at education at delmarmethodist.org. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for bringing us those people who are new to our community, who need a connection to feel welcome. Please help us to reach out to share your love with those in need as your hands and feet on earth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This week, I suggest you look for someone new to your community whom you can welcome and show God's love. How can you make this person or family feel more at home in their new community? I know you can think of something to do to make them feel welcome. In the meantime, I will see you next Sunday. Have a great week. Today's gospel reading is from the book of Mark, chapter five, verses 21 through 43. Listen now for word in wisdom. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, for she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately, her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him, and he went in to where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Words to bring God nearer. The word of God in Jesus for God's wisdom all around us, for God's word and wisdom in us. Thanks be to God. Where does it hurt? That's the question that our series asks today, and it is a question to ask when we look at today's scripture. Our scripture is a story of healing, two stories of healing, a double healing story. As Christians, we are a little off in our perceptions of Jesus and Jewish purity codes. We tend to think these stories are about Jesus rejecting Jewish purity codes. Funny enough, they aren't mentioned at all in the story. No one is pointing and yelling, unclean, not once. What the story is about is sickness and healing based on faith, which is mentioned. Jesus cares about healing and wholeness. There are countless stories of Jesus healing in the Bible. When Jesus heals someone, they are restored to wholeness according to the purity codes. So we can't really make the argument that Jesus doesn't care about that. Did you notice the number 12 in the story? The 12-year-old daughter who is dying 
and the 12 years of hemorrhaging that the suffering woman has experienced. The common number tells you that the stories belong together. The stories are quite a contrast in socioeconomic life experiences. The daughter is the child of a wealthy leader in the synagogue. She has all of the advantages in life. She has a loving father coming to Jesus, the famous healer to advocate on her behalf. And then there is the hemorrhaging woman. She's on her own. She has no patient advocate. She has been made poor by all of the medical care that she has sought to no avail. They have taken advantage of her situation and she is impoverished. As long as the girl has been alive, the woman has been trying to find a cure. She comes to Jesus certain that if she touches the edges of his robe, she will be healed. Now that's faith or hope or something very powerful indeed. She's not asking for laying out of hands or a mud spittle combo or a special prayer. She is certain that if she touches his robe, really the fringes on his prayer shawl, that she will be made well. She doesn't need to talk to him or make eye contact even. The fringe, or the talit as they are called, represent the Torah, the commandments, the law, the long history of the Jewish people with God. She believes if she touches the fringes worn by the healer and teacher deeply connected to this long, beautiful faith tradition, that she will be made well. That's a deep faith. And Jairus believed that Jesus could help his daughter. He, a wealthy, powerful man, appealed to Jesus to come to his home to help him to save the life of his daughter. Jesus cared about hurt people, and it is our mission as followers of Jesus to care too. Taking faith out of it for a moment, it's part of being human to care about others. To develop compassion for those we don't understand is important for our faith journey. To grow in compassion is to grow in spirit. We can enlarge our hearts and minds to be in the shoes of another person, but to suspend judgment can be difficult. Our minds go there so easily. How sad it is that so many people think of churches as places of judgment, and a lot of that is admittedly our own doing. That's why we have to explicitly say that we're welcoming to LGBTQIA folks. Because most folks, when they hear church, don't assume that. Quite the opposite. So often the church is a keeper of the flame and not the one to go out of their way to welcome. So often the church is the preserver of the tradition and not the innovator in reaching out in love to those on the outs. People wonder if they'll really be welcome in church when their marriages fall apart. If they are gay, lesbian, or transgender, or if they have a child who is. What if they don't wear the right clothes, or if they're a different color than the majority of the other worshipers? Or if their children make noise in worship? Or if they don't have the right kind of job, or if they are young? What has the church become? Sometimes it's more of a club existing for its members. Have you ever heard the story of Gloria? She was in her 80s and was asked to speak at a church meeting as they considered whether or not to become a welcoming congregation a congregation that welcomes people of all sexual orientations. When I was eight years old, I was helping my mom, who served on the altar guild. One of her roles was to clean the sanctuary every week. She had taken the communion cup and plate off the table and placed them on the front pew. Now, the church where I grew up didn't allow lay people, let alone women, to serve communion. But despite that, I was pretending to be the minister with the elements. Just as I raised up the cup and was whispering the words, I'd heard so many times I felt two strong hands on my shoulders. It was the pastor, and I had been caught. I froze. As he leaned down to speak in my ear, I knew that I was in deep trouble. But what he said to me was this. It's a joy, isn't it, to invite people to Christ's table. I hope you'll remember that everyone is always welcome. I'm 82 years old, and I don't completely understand what lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people experience. But I do know that my church is a church where everyone is welcome at the communion table, and in the pulpit, and in every aspect of church life. So I'm voting in favor of becoming a welcoming congregation.
congregation. What a beautiful story. As a child, Gloria was shown the path of compassion. Our growth in compassion can last a lifetime if we attend to it. What if we really cultivated the question, where does it hurt as part of our spiritual lives together as a community? What if we went toward the hurt instead of away from it? What if we could, get, we could at least get good at listening to those in pain? Can we be with people in their pain instead of trying to talk over it or pretend it doesn't exist because it makes us uncomfortable? That's a very natural part of being human, avoiding pain. The Swiss psychologist Carl Jung said, people will do anything, no matter how absurd, to avoid facing their own souls. It is true. We stay so busy or we sleep for hours. There are many compulsive behaviors to distract us from our real hurts, from our souls. Society mostly encourage us, encourages us to avoid being real. But Jesus' example is that he goes there. He goes there like he goes to Jairus' house to see his daughter. Jesus feels and acknowledges the power of healing like he does with a woman. He easily could have ignored her and just considered her a bump from the crowd like the disciples did. But Jesus sees her. He acknowledges her. Can we do that? Can we cultivate and work on becoming more comfortable with where it hurts in ourselves and others? Can we go toward the hurt instead of running away? Granted, sometimes we aren't ready. We aren't strong enough to draw near the hard stuff. Perhaps the time isn't right. Or perhaps the hard stuff is too dangerous to get near. But sometimes we need courage and bravery. Sometimes we just need to stick with it. We can look at these two stories and feel pretty discouraged. We certainly aren't Jesus. His presence was healing for Jairus' daughter. We don't have that kind of power. We know that we can't take away pain or suffering. We can sit there, be there, but that doesn't feel like enough sometimes. But perhaps we do have the power of the hemorrhaging woman. She reached out her hand for healing. She knew she needed healing. She knew she was in pain and she sought out Jesus. She pushed her way through a crowd to get close enough to touch Jesus, just touch him. She didn't make an appointment with him. Instead, she was scrappy enough to draw near. Could we do that? Could we push our way through to be close to the things that bring healing? Maybe that's coming to church or spending some time in quiet. We know what a fight it is to take that time in modern life. Maybe it's taking a walk or a run or some time with friends. How will we draw near to the source of our healing? Where does it hurt? Can we reach out our hand to be healed? These aren't quick or easy questions or answers. They take some digging down to discover what we really believe, what we really think is important to be in service to in our lives. It's more than a slogan or description. We like to think that we are compassionate, open-minded and open-hearted, generous, you name it. We know how we like to think of ourselves, but are we willing to put in the work and sacrifice to truly live it out? Do you know the story about the man being tailgated by a stressed out woman on a busy street? Suddenly the light turned yellow just in front of him. He did the right thing, stopping at the crosswalk even though he could have beaten the red light by accelerating through the intersection. The tailgating woman was furious and honked her horn, screaming in frustration as she missed her chance to get through the intersection, dropping her cell phone. As she was still in mid-rant, she heard a tap on her window and looked up into the face of a very serious police officer. The officer ordered her to exit her car with her hands up. He took her to the police station where she was searched, fingerprinted, photographed, and placed in a holding cell. After a couple of hours, a policeman approached the cell and opened the door. She was escorted back to the booking desk where the arresting officer was waiting with her personal effects. He said, I'm very sorry for this mistake. You see, I pulled up behind your car while you were blowing your horn, flipping off the guy in front of you, and cussing a blue streak at him. 
I noticed the, what would Jesus do, bumper sticker, the follow me to Sunday school bumper sticker, and the chrome-plated Christian fish emblem on the trunk. Naturally, I assumed you had stolen the car. In our walk following Jesus, may we be like the woman who reaches out to Jesus, acknowledging her own pain, acknowledging her suffering, acknowledging her need. May we not be the ones to broadcast proudly who we profess to be, but may we be the ones on the path reaching out for our own healing and the healing of others and reaching out to be supportive companions on the journey. May our faith be a source of wellness, not harm, for ourselves and for others. May it be so. Amen. Almighty God, help us to grow in faith such that it will not waver as the hemorrhaging woman in Jarius May it grow in strength and compassion to make us well and be healed. God, it is hard to face and own our suffering, much less be brave enough to share it. Give us courage to accept the compassion and care of others as we grow together. May we break down those things that separate us and others from your compassion and care, prompting us to ask, where does it hurt? Help us to recognize the pain present in our community. Empower us to build good relationships in our communities. We pray for those who are sick and weighed down in body or spirit, for those who are overworked, for those who need a break, for those who near the end of life. May they know your peace. Guide those who are lost or perplexed, all who need shepherding, and for those who teach and guide others in their work, in their home, in their voluntary service. May they give and receive your peace. Guide us to provide for those with food scarcity and for all who hunger and thirst for your love and grace. We pray for our country and for the governments of the world. May they find peace, create peace, and work for peace. By the power of the Holy Spirit, God opens places for good news, for people who do not know how much you love them, and for all who share the gospel. May your spirit break down barriers, open hearts, bringing healing and peace. We now ask God to hear the prayers of our own minds and hearts. These and all our prayers we ask in the name of Jesus and pray his words saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. now in the peace of Christ. Go with open hearts and minds to see where there is hurt. Go ready to ask where does it hurt and be prepared to listen. Know that God is with us in our suffering and in our joy and all the times in between. Go and be who God calls you to be in this world. Go filled with compassion for all on this journey through life. Go in peace. Amen. Send out to Jesus' name.